Right now what I'd like to do is to introduce my colleague and one of the moving forces behind this series, uh, Professor Jonathan Fang. Well, it's a great pleasure for me today to introduce our speaker, Chancellor Michael Drake. I often say it's a great pleasure, but this time it really, really is. <laughs> Chancellor Drake is a graduate of Stanford and UCF Med UCSF Medical School, where he served on the faculty for many years before coming here. His research specialty is in glaucoma, and he's a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy's Institute of Medicine. Prior to arriving to UC Irvine, he was Vice President for Health Affairs for the entire UC system, directing research programs on tobacco, breast cancer, HIV AIDS, and also uh, starting launching new initiatives to train physicians to care for the underserved populations in California. In 2005, he was named UC Irvine's fifth chancellor. Since his appointment, the number of applicants for undergraduate admission here has almost doubled. As uh, many of you are well aware, last year there were more than 80,000 applicants for 6,000 spots. And he has led UCI forward in many other ways including the um, establishment of schools of law and education. He is a leading figure in education on the national stage and currently serves in leadership positions of the Division I Board of the NCAA and the Association of American Universities. Of particular relevance to today's talk, Michael Drake's commitment to values, inclusion, and diversity have really been a cornerstone of his tenure here as Chancellor. Let me not go into all of the achievements in this area, which are many and would take too long, but let me just illustrate with a uh, personal anecdote. A few years ago, John Stupar and I made an appointment to talk to the Chancellor to propose an idea for a speaker series, which we had tentatively titled, What Matters to Me and Why. <laughs> we got to his office, and he started asking very kindly about our work and our research. After a while, I started wondering when we would finally get around to talking about the proposal. <laughs> After a while, finally, he asked us about it. We told him what we had in mind and all the reasons we thought it would be a fantastic idea. Next, he asked us how much it would cost. I told him our estimate. And I was about to launch into a long, prepared argument about how many lunches we would need, the uh, importance of having the talks videotaped, um, cost for publicity, etc. But before I even got started, he said, done, you got it. John and I were shocked and just sat there in stunned silence for a little bit. After a while, Chancellor Drake said, I bet now you wish you had asked for more. <laughs> <laughs> the amazing thing was, that was exactly what I was thinking at that point. <laughs> so his support for this series has been strong and essential from the beginning, and we hope you will consider it as a small but significant part of his legacy here at UC Irvine. I speak of his legacy, maybe a bit prematurely, but uh, because, as many of you know, Pastor Drake has recently announced that he will be leaving at the end of the year to become president of the Ohio State University. To prepare you for what I'm going to say next, let me first explain that I think very highly of UC Irvine. Also, I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, <laughs> while my father was a student at the University of Michigan. So you see, it would be genetically impossible for me to congratulate Chancellor Drake on his In fact, I can probably speak for many of you when I say that my initial reaction upon hearing this news was, what were you thinking? <laughs> Ohio State? Have you not been watching the Weather Channel this year? <laughs> but seriously, I think I can really speak for everyone here when I say that we wish you all the best and continued success at Ohio State. And with that, please join me in thanking and welcoming Chester Michael Drake. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks. Nice to uh, see everyone and uh, to have a chance to participate in this uh, series. Uh, when John and uh, Professor Fang came by with this idea, it was a great idea. Uh, and we always like good ideas. And we we're very happy to have a chance to do something with our lunchtime, to bring people together to talk about those things that help to guide them and, and to lead them uh, forward. So I'm, uh, I was more than happy to be able to uh, give some small measure of support to the series. I'm glad to see that it's been so successful. We're really, really pleased about that. Uh, you know, I talk 
uh, a lot, and, and um, when Professor Haynes was mentioning at the beginning uh, the sort of values uh, paradigm that we use, uh, I talk a lot about values, and actually I'm going to speak about values today in the what matters to me and why, because that's really where the values came from. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little inside baseball. The, uh, my first day uh, here in Irvine, when I was, after I'd been appointed chancellor, I was uh, going to meet with some of our uh, uh, strongest community supporters. And it turned out that I had a going away uh, event from, with a group that I had sponsored the night before, and whatever we had eaten didn't agree, and I had a, a little tummy virus. Uh, which meant I was in the hotel room with the, the, the curtains closed, feeling awful. And so I had to actually cancel out of my uh, meetings with these community leaders who were uh, thoughtful. And was sitting there then with nothing to do for uh, a couple of hours, but thinking about starting this new job, having been in health sciences, having been focused at being a medical doctor for my career. This was a, a real transition to go from health sciences in a more focused way to higher education more broadly. And so I had been thinking a bit about this, thinking about how people manage companies and enterprises, and thought about the importance of having values to help uh, guide us as we're moving forward. And so I got a piece of paper, and I wrote down what would a good series of values be. And I thought we should have seven. And so I thought seven was a good number. Three is not quite enough, and 10 is too many. So, uh, so seven seemed like a good number. And so I, I wrote down seven uh, words and then thought about those a lot, maybe refined or crossed out one or two, and came up with the seven values that Doug mentioned earlier today. And so the what matters are really those values, and the why I'll tell you after I talk a little bit about them and what I mean by them, and I'm happy to have a chance to share them. So the seven uh, values that we speak of are respect, intellectual curiosity, integrity, commitment, empathy, appreciation broadly for others, and fun. And I, I speak of these at, at convocation when we first start with uh, freshmen. I don't know how many freshmen actually remember that, but I always uh, say that at convocation. I tend to talk about them at graduation uh, when the freshmen are leaving uh, to see how many have, have stuck. And we think about the ways that they really help us to make our lives uh, work better. So first, so what? So these. The values are kind of used in this, as I mentioned values, values are used kind of to be like guide posts or things to help us uh, as we're moving through, through life. They're not uh, paragraphs uh, long. They're simple things that can be remembered uh, one at a time. As I just mentioned, each one is a word. And if we think of them like traffic signs, if you'll think of all of us when we go and get in cars, these are powerful potentially lethal weapons. They have incredible variability. They can go wherever you want at, at, at widely different rates of speed. We all have different places we're going, different cultures, different belief systems, all kinds of things. But we're able to get in cars and drive together um, in the community with very little mishap because we have a few simple guidelines. We drive on the right side of the road instead of the left. Let's say we were confused about that. Uh, that would be difficult. So we drive on the right side of the road. Red means stop. Um, there's the few things that are very, very simple that everyone knows, and those things are enough to allow us to do these complicated, interrelated tasks uh, by always uh, maintaining a focus on a few simple things that guide us. And so the values are meant to be simple things that guide us in our daily activities and as we move our life forward. So the first one is respect. And I always start with respect, I think particularly in a pluralistic, diverse community like ours, that respect for other people is a critical part of being able to have a community that gets along with itself, a community that works. And that respect means respect for yourself as well as respect for others. To think about the uh, great amazing thing a human being is. Not a casual thing, but a great amazing thing a human being is. And we need to treat each human being as the great amazing thing that he or she happens to be. And I think as we do that, we're able to do many, many other things. But starting from a basis of respect, of recognizing the, the real specialness that each person has, that's a, that's a very, very important thing for us. The second one is intellectual curiosity. And intellectual curiosity in, our, in a, a system like, or a place like ours means the interest in learning and in teaching and in discovering. Our main product, if I can say product here, the main thing that we produce here at the university is knowledge. 
We produce new knowledge by uh, faculty and students and staff working together to either do things creatively on the stage or special in the, la in the laboratories so that we have knowledge that no one had before or a way of doing something that no one was able to do before. So that producing that new knowledge and writing it down and publishing it or uh, uh, sharing it in a classroom, that producing knowledge is, is a critical part of what we do here at a research university. We also then share that knowledge. We, we produce it. We share it, as I mentioned, in, in journal articles and other places on, on TV and different media and newspapers. And we also then share it actively in the classroom, where we transmit knowledge as we actually often create new knowledge with our students as we work forward. I teach a class, as many of you know, in winter quarter. I teach a freshman seminar. And we are taking knowledge and sharing that with the students and discussing it and creating new ideas and new approaches to old problems. And, and that's really our, our raison d'etre. It's what we do here at the university. And uh, so intellectual curiosity, the joy of creating knowledge and of sharing knowledge and the joy of learning are things that are really important to who we are here as a university. So our principal value uh, for us is to be intellectually curious. Another thing that's a really important principal value to us, and actually it ties very nicely with intellectual curiosity, is integrity. And integrity, as I use it, means telling the truth, uh, being clear and honest with yourself always, and then being clear and honest as you're sharing information with other people. Particularly if you're creating knowledge, you have to be uh, quite compulsive about making sure that you uh, practice that and share that with the utmost integrity, that you mean what you say, that you say what you mean. And, and when that happens, actually, people are able to trust you. And then you build this great human bond, which is trust. And that then allows the entire enterprise to, uh, to, to move forward. Now, I mentioned commitment. And I think commitment is very, very important because all the things we want to do, if we uh, do them in a haphazard or um, half-hearted way, then we get kind of a, a poor facsimile of what, uh, what we could uh, produce if we did our very best. So in producing knowledge and in sharing knowledge and treating people with respect and building trust, we want to be really committed to doing our best at those kinds of things. And that's a, a, an important value, is to be really passionate and committed uh, to what we do. Another important value, though, I would say is empathy. And uh, it's very important for us to, as we are communicating with people, as we're talking with people, as we're interacting with people, to be able to understand how things feel from their point of view. I had a game uh, I played, uh, I guess literally, with my, at the time, 12-year-old son who I was teaching to play chess. And he was very competitive, you know, like 12-year-olds uh, can be. And he was that kind of a kid. And so we'd play chess. And when we'd start to play chess, because I believed in commitment, I believed that I had to play as hard as I could. But I'd played more chess than he had. And so if I played as hard as I could, it wasn't much of a match. So what I would do is I'd take pieces away from my side. And I'd start out with half the pieces or a third of the pieces. He'd start out with a full set. And then we'd play. And I'd do my very, very best. And we'd get to a place, you know, not too long, where he was going to lose. And because he was competitive, he'd always be totally annoyed at me, you know, and angry and uh, frustrated. And then uh, what I would do then is when he was ready to resign, uh, I would say, well, OK, stop. And we'd take and we'd turn the board around. And then I'd play from his side. And, and then I'd do everything I could to win from his side. And I would win. Uh, uh, just <laughs> you know, that was. That was my job, uh, you know, and I was committed uh, uh, to it. Win. And, and let me say, we did that over and over again. And, and then what I would do is I would, uh, as we did that, I would take away fewer and fewer pieces. Uh, um, and then it got to the point, place uh, really within a couple of months where I couldn't beat him uh, no matter what I, I did. But, but the point was to show him that you, you, know, you always need to look at things from the other side. Uh, think about things uh, from the other person's point of view understand, uh, have empathy and care about that person from that person's point of view. When you came to ask about this series, I will apologize for chatting to, introduce, to entertain myself. I knew what we were going to talk about, and I knew that I was going to fund it. So, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, so from your point of view, that was an easy part of the discussion. It didn't take very long. And, uh, so I, but I like that, um, just the lesson, I hope, for him of turning the chessboard around before you give up or when you think you're going to give up, and looking at things from the other side. Let me say also that I would just say, in response to a question that hasn't been asked, this is really useful if you are working with other people to try to 
uh, help them uh, see something you wish them to do, uh, like to compromise or to change their position. It's great if you will think about this from the uh, point of view of the person who's hearing what you're saying and try and say, how, how is this going to sound to them? Why would they want to do this or why would they not want to do this? And gosh, if I can see why I'd like to do it, but if I sat on the other side of the table, it would sound ridiculous. It's probably going to sound ridiculous to the person sitting on the other side of the table. And it's good to think about that ahead of time and maybe say, gosh, what, <clears throat> what would we have to do to make this make sense <clears throat> to somebody from, from a different point of view? So that's the empathy, caring about other people, understanding their point of view. And that then merges directly into appreciation. And, and there I mean appreciation broadly for the context that other people, uh, with the, when, within which other people live their lives. Um, who is she? Uh, where does she come from? Why is she thinking things in this, in this fashion? And, and, and understanding and appreciating that, I think, helps us a lot in dealing with people, particularly people who we disagree with. I mean, there are people who think, oh my goodness gracious, uh, that's wrong. But if you take a step back, and kind of think about the context of that person's life. They tend to believe those things for some reason. And I think appreciating their different points of view and where they come from is very, very helpful in dealing with people, particularly where we, when we have different points of, of view. And then finally, uh, fun. You know, if you were to do all these things, really kind of relentlessly practicing these things all the time, and we're just miserable, uh, then, then you've missed something. I mean, we, our lives are here for us to enjoy, and so we'd like to practice all the values simultaneously, relentlessly, actively, but do so in a way that uh, our lives are enjoyable. And I think that's a, a good measure of whether or not we're doing things correctly. And if fun is missing, I think that, you, again, it's a time to take a step back and think of what it is that I'm doing with my life that makes it that it's so hard. Why? I'd like to make this enjoyable. And, and I think that's something that we value very, very much. And if we think of these things, uh, respect, intellectual curiosity, uh, commitment, integrity, uh, appreciation, empathy, and fun, and think about practicing all of them all the time, um, then the kind of why, the what matters to me would be the values, the why, the, the why kind of is implicit in that. And I would imagine you first to think about a person who uh, exemplified those uh, particular uh, things. Thank you. Uh, who exemplified those particular uh, values. So someone who uh, was very respectful in the way that she dealt with other people. Someone who was really interested in learning and sharing knowledge, really intellectually curious. Someone who you could really trust and rely on, uh, particularly in, in the most difficult times. Someone who was actively, passionately committed to the things that she believed in. But as she went through the world as an actively passionately committed person, she also displayed great empathy for others. She cared about other people, and she understood the context in which other people lived their lives. And then she was always up for having a good time. I mean, that would be the kind of person who you'd like to hang out with. Uh, at least, that's the kind of person I'd like to hang out with. And, and, and the kind of person, and, and if you were that kind of person, then you'd be a person who would be surrounded by people who loved and admired you. And that would be the things that it would, uh, those things coming together would help you to have a life that, that made sense and a life that was worthwhile and a life that led, that led to purpose. So I think that, that one of the reasons that we'd like to practice values and use values as guidelines is that it helps us to be the kind of people who other people admire and would like to be around and it makes our lives more, more pleasant. Now another um, uh, reason for using values and kind of focusing on values as we go forward is that lives can be difficult. I, I, it would be fun to ask, how many people here, just to do a show of hands, have had a, a difficult time uh, at some time during their lives? <laughs> just, uh, now, and I'm looking at some people here who have never had a difficult time, and I'd, like, I'd be interested in chatting about that. Uh, <clears throat> so everybody else, I'm sorry, they're not these uh, two guys, but everybody else has had a difficult time. Everybody had, there, there, there are things in life that are difficult. I was watching a TV show a couple of nights ago, uh, Sunday, and it was a 50th anniversary reunion of the Beatles. I don't know if anybody saw that. A couple of uh, all the oldsters here. All <laughs> yeah, 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 go oldsters. <laughs> and, you know, as a teenager, they had magical lives. I mean, really magical, not almost unreal lives of privilege and fun. I mean, my goodness gracious. 
um, uh, everybody's favorite person, always having a good time, uh, what magical lives. If we would think about, and then two of them are up on stage, the two that are still uh, living. And, and even that uh, is a reflection of the difficulty that happens in life. So there were these four wonderful lads with great lives, and if you look at their, um, uh, the two who are standing on stage, two are not there, one who died in his 50s from lung cancer, as everyone knows, another who was murdered at 40. So, I mean, a real tragedy in the group. Their own personal lives, they've lost children uh, to disease and tragedy, another uh, has lost his wife uh, uh, to disease and, and tragedy, and so there were real uh, human suffering of the kind that everyone does, even the most magical person on earth has this human suffering that, that happens, and, and, and life can be difficult and, and challenging. And if you use values to help guide the way you're conducting your life, I believe, and then you look back on your life, look back on difficult times or on difficult decisions or on uh, difficult places you've been, but you stay true to values as you were kind of migrating or navigating your way through, you tend to be able to look back without regret. You can look back sometimes with sorrow. Um, you can look back with unhappiness, but you don't look back with regret saying, my goodness, I should have behaved differently or I should have been a different person there. If you've kind of stayed true to guiding principles that help you, you move along. There's a, um, a place uh, I visited in, in Jerusalem, a uh, hillside, uh, uh, that's a cemetery that's been there for thousands of years. And it leads to a sharp valley uh, that then goes up to the uh, place where the Temple Mount is, uh, that's kind of in the distance as you stand there. So if I were standing there, this would be about a mile in front. And there's a, a little uh, valley that walks below this um, uh, ancient cemetery. And as our guide was talking about biblical times, he says, you know, uh, the, as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, this is in fact a cemetery and this valley that had to be traversed. And, Sort of, it was laid there before us, and and that's something that sort of happens in life. You walk through places, you you go places that are difficult and challenging. If you're guided by values and principles, and doing your best to be a good person, step by step, day by day, you make it through those times uh, uh, more easily. And again, you can look back as you on the pathway that you use to traverse those difficult times, and I think do that without regret. So I think it's important to help protect your future. To have a, a, a guide post that you use today. There's a poem that I, 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 uh, I quote, I, 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 I borrow in quoting from Robert Kennedy, and it's um, uh, famous from, he uh, used it the night that Martin Luther King was assassinated, and it also is at his gravesite. If anybody been to the Robert Kennedy gravesite in DC? You know, um, uh, a worthwhile, if you're in Washington, DC sometime, may I, on the side? Uh, uh, Arlington Cemetery is on the metro line, so it's uh, right there. It's no, it's 10 minutes uh, from downtown DC, and you get out and walk, and there you're at this national cemetery. And as you walk through it um, and see the uh, the luminous Americans who are there, it's a great reflection of American history in in many ways. Um, so I would uh, recommend that as something to do that you can do in an hour or two hours for no money. It's a, a dollar metro ticket. And there are the Kennedy grave sites. There's Robert E. Lee's house with uh, Civil War soldiers buried in Mrs. Lee's Rose Garden. There are the Supreme Court justices on the hillside. There are many, many uh, people who died in battle serving our country, many other uh, people who are famous uh, leaders of the country. And so you can kind of actually walk through the history of the United States um, as you walk through there. And one gravesite uh, is where Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy are in kind of a region. And, and Robert Kennedy, he has a poem by Aeschylus that he read the night that Martin Luther King was uh, killed to quite a crowd. And it, it says, the poem is, while we are sleeping, uh, sadness that cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our despair and against our own will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And it's uh, written 2,000 years ago uh, by Aeschylus and it sort of says that life can be difficult and actually life is going to be difficult and a part of the maturing living process is to go through those difficult times. And I would just say that I, I believe and I would uh, say 
that having values that you know, know, knowing those things that are important to you and making sure you stay true to your own values is really, really important for making it through those difficult times. So, so I think that values are really important for that. So that's sort of the why of values. Uh, in thinking about the individual ones, I mentioned uh, respect and the, the importance of respect really is that it allows us to get along with people from different backgrounds and different points of view. That's really, really important. Intellectual curiosity, I think, is an important value for human beings. I, I was thinking about the, um, this uh, came to me, I was walking, talking to a high school friend a, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I was thinking about the um, uh, biomass on the, the planet, so the, from sort of plankton, single cellular organisms up through the different stops on the food chain to people. And there's a huge biomass out there that's not people. You know, the, the overwhelming majority of it is. We are a fraction of a percent. And we have this thing that we can do that the others don't do the same. Certainly, the single cellular organisms don't do it, or the uh, plankton, or uh, uh, trees uh, don't seem to be doing this. And I don't know, insects, you know, they're about 30 times the biomass of insects as there are people on the, the planet. Insects aren't doing this so much, or the <laughs> mammals that eat the insects, or the snakes that eat the mammals that eat the insects as you kind of move up the food chain, people uh, um, use their minds to entertain themselves and to think great thoughts. I mean, most of that biomass is spending its time as we speak trying to survive. I mean, the trees are soaking up energy for the purpose of surviving. And, and the tide pools, things are, are camouflaged and swimming around trying not to be eaten. And uh, there's this whole thing that, that survival is really the, the driving force of life on Earth. It, with people, people have been able, human beings have been able to get past survival. I had a, I had a lab, let me just say this, we had a, a yellow lab, a wonderful dog, Herman, you're a wonderful dog. And uh, what he wanted to do was eat. So, so what he would say to you, what, what would he rather be doing now than whatever he was doing? He was either sleeping or he'd be uh, eating or looking for food. That's what he wanted to do. We have a, a, a joke at home where we describe somebody who can't help something. We say it's like putting a pizza in the back of the car with Bannock, our dog. Um, if you put a pizza back there, he was going to eat it. And, and, and I've just used that as, as a higher, pretty far up on the food chain. But what he's interested in doing, he was, it, it was eating and really in kind of doing, pre preparing himself for survival, even though he was able to play in things. He really wanted to eat. People do things like do research. Uh, because they're intellectually curious. People do things like write plays. People do things like make paintings to um, uh, express how they're feeling or, or share something. People do things like, like write songs uh, that they put together to convey emotion over centuries to people. So, so there's this great thing that we're able to do at the top of the intellectual development of the food chain, which is to use our minds to create and reimagine and uh, polish and make beautiful the world as a focused endeavor that's separate from just protecting ourselves, gathering energy to survive, reproducing or whatever. We're actually trying to do things that make life fun. And that intellectual curiosity, I think, fits right into that, what it is that we do as people that makes us special, what human beings do that makes them special. And our university is a place created to do exactly that. I mean, that's what we are here for. Uh, we all come together for that purpose of new ideas, uh, learning new things, creating new knowledge, and then transmitting that knowledge to other people. So kind of a principal value of our community would be intellectual curiosity. Uh, the third one on our list is integrity. And again, telling the truth and being a, a trustworthy person, I think, is critically important. Our bonds, if you think of the people who you are most closely bonded with and the people who you trust the most, it's sort of a description of the same people or somebody you don't trust, that's somebody who you can't really appreciate fully or get close to. So I think that, that integrity and trust are incredibly important for human-human in, for human interactions. That's a great thing. And then I think that uh, commitment is important. I, you, you know, as mentioned, I'm on the board of the NC2A. Sports is something that uh, we all rally around, we rally around our eaters. Uh, and what, what I think makes sports so compelling is that we see people committed fully to doing that. They're challenged. And a beautiful play on a field is someone who's really committed to doing something that's spectacular. And winning or losing are great. But actually, the, the, uh, you can, beautiful plays aren't winning or losing. 
they're seeing somebody who's really committed, who's really performing at a high level. That, that, that's the thing that's emotionally um, uh, wonderful, I think, for us. And then we have, um, uh, as we move forward, we have uh, empathy. And I think that empathy is really, really important. I, I felt this a lot in my practice of medicine, in where integrity was really important, and knowing the right answer was really, really important, and communicating were really, really important. But if you just went and told somebody the exact truth, cut and dried, without any consideration of how they were going to hear it or how they were feeling, that, that could be uh, downright cruel. And so it was very important, I thought, when communicating with patients to take into context what this is going to sound like when, when he or she hears what you're saying and to really be able to turn the board around and sit there in, in the patient chair and hear the information as you were deciding what words to use to be able to share this. And I think that was a, an important thing. I think that's important as we're talking with our colleagues. Appreciation, I think, is really, really uh, uh, important. Appreciate uh, uh, comes from, I think, the Latin to add value, like a praise. And, and it means that you see the circumstances that people are in, and then you place that in a context that it makes some sense, that you really uh, appreciate. I, I can understand why somebody's saying that. I can understand how your life might cause you to feel that way. I, I want to try to be broad and, and seeing the context of your life, the, the forest for the tree. And I think that's an important thing for us to do, again, in a pluralistic society. And finally, fun. Uh, and as I said, at the end of the day, the idea is that you practice all the values all the time, all together. You don't pick two or three of them, you know, and throw the others out. But at the end of the day, that ought to be fun. And I think that um, in thinking about who we are and what our lives are and how our lives work best, it's when those lives are, are fun. So that, that's the, uh, the what matters is really values. The why is because they help us to uh, create, I think, a, a life that we can be proud of and that we can enjoy and that helps to elevate our community broadly. So let me um, uh, stop there. I think we have, oh, we have, we have time. Sure. I was going to stop there because I hadn't looked what, what time it was. But I, I want to, uh, so let me uh, rewind. I'll DVR myself for a minute. And I wanted to say something about then uh, uh, compassion. And, and empathy. So empathy, compassion, and um, I did have a quote I wanted to share on, on compassion, which is one I think is great. It's the Dalai Lama, when he was here, speaks a lot about compassion and thinks of that as sort of the central principle of human interaction, that if we, if we behave in a compassionate way, things work well. And there are two, uh, uh, two quotes by the Dalai Lama I wanted to share. So one is that love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. Another one is, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. And I think those are uh, good, uh, good things to remember. And I think those things work quite, quite well. And uh, let me just say that uh, I have time for uh, a, a few questions and comments at the end, but that the uh, uh, working in this community has uh, been, continues to be a tremendous uh, privilege for, for me and I know for, for Brenda as well. The, the, one of the great things about our community is that we've been developing. We weren't completely made or finished. Uh, we're not an old community, we're a present community and we're looking toward the future. And I would just say that the way that this community has worked together through uh, opportunities and challenges to continue to make itself stronger and broader and more inclusive and, and uh, more diverse and more outstanding has been just a, uh, a real joy and I uh, know that we'll be in you just forever and really uh, really proud and excited about that. So thank you all very very much. As is our custom, uh, there is time for question and answers, and as I mentioned at the outset of the program, there are uh, mics on either side, and so uh, please remember to speak up, uh, limit yourself to a question rather than a, a soliloquy, uh, and then other people can participate. So the floor is open. Chancellor, I, I always no. like to ask the first question about your faith. Uh, our speakers, I always ask, uh, how has your faith uh, influenced you in what you uh, believe, what's, what matters to you, and why? And then I will be passing this uh, around to whoever's next. So let me answer it uh, uh, sort of broadly. And 
um, I, I have a map in my office of the uh, world, and it's a flat projection of the world. It, it has um, the center is the Greenwich Mean, and and then south is on the top of the map, and north is at the bottom. And so what uh, what most people say when they look at it is it's upside down, uh, because we're used to looking at maps where first North America is in the center, and the rest of the world kind of spreads out, and north is at the top. And I was traveling someplace, and I thought, you know, the world, the world is a sphere, and it's out there in space. There's no kind of up or down, or left or right. It's just, you know, it's, it's space. And so we've oriented to these maps so that when we look at, or if we spin a globe, you know, uh, the United States is kind of pointed right at our eyes. Without us having, we don't have to bend our heads very much. And if you were in Australia, you have to kind of you know, bend around down there to find you. And I thought, well, that's kind of unusual that, that we've kind of oriented so that we're in the center when we're really, it's all, it's all the center. And so I would say that in kind of picking values or, or things that help to guide one forward, I think that there are many ways that those um, um, apply or uh, that one can come in contact with those. So one way that one comes in contact with values is through faith. And there are many, many different religions around the world. And so my, my view is that faith is one of the ways that people can help to orient themselves and, um, and that I uh, appreciate the different faiths and religions that people have and how those orientations are different in many ways, but I think they're also the same in many ways. And then I think there are people who use values that are not faith based, and I think those can work as well. I mean, I think it's a, the, the concept is trying to help simplify and identify for yourself those uh, guide markers that help you uh, negotiate your life. And I think that's a central tenet of the faith-based community, and I think that's a great thing. Thank you. Thanks. Hearing no further, uh, okay, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Um, you spoke a lot about values, and I was just curious which one or two values you think people struggle with the most when they hit a hard spot. What, what, can I ask you which one, if you think of which ones you think people struggle with most when they hit a hard spot? Hard spot? Fun, or possibly empathy, because you'll be really self, or I sometimes get self-centered when I go through uh, struggles. Yes. So I think I liked your answer very much. Per per perfect answer. Uh, <laughs> outstanding answer. Uh, and I liked your answer because the, each of us has different parts of, in, in, first you get to make your own value, you, you have whatever values you want. So that's it, you, you get to have as many as you like and whatever they are. And I think that all of them, um, each of us has difficulty with one or another in different times and different circumstances. And uh, fun is difficult for me, you know. Uh, uh, for my colleagues who work, a who work all the time, you have to remember that it's okay to do something that's fun. And, and, and one tends to forget that because of obligations that are there. So I, I know that's one I try to think of. Uh, all the other ones, I think, come up at different times. Empathy, I think, is a really important value to be able to, uh, to have. And, and I think it's a good thing to continue to um, uh, elevate ourselves uh, toward. I think integrity is really hard. Consistency and integrity, they're oftentimes when they're easier answers than the answer that's the right answer or the best answer. And I think there's a great tendency toward easier answers along the way. Uh, but I think that the concept is that you need to kind of use all of them together uh, to have a, a full circle. But I appreciate, I appreciate that question. Yes. Chancellor Jay, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I'm a sixth-year doctoral student about to finish up my PhD here at UC Irvine. Congratulations. I'm just wondering, um, particularly as you're about to go through a great professional transition, yes. what sort of advice or words of wisdom, in addition to keeping the fun, that you can recommend for anyone who's about to go through a new transition? So I'll, I'll back up. I'll give my whole I'll give my whole talk again, and uh, uh, I think that um, uh, values. When I, I sort of came up with these, I mean, this is the me, uh, me. But as I was going through a professional transition, I mean, literally on day one of this particular job, I thought, gosh, how, what do I want to make sure I remember as I'm doing this? And I think that the idea of guide, guiding principles, 
uh, just words really than, rather than paragraphs, is that they're helpful for those times of uncertainty. When you know what to do or know what the answer or is straightforward or you don't have any choice, I mean, then it's pretty simple. You just do what you, what you have to do or, or what you should. Where guiding principles become important is when, you don't, when there's no one in front of you telling you what to do. I, I, our, uh, a story I tell, I'm about to tell, I can tell, uh, is I, we have a, our younger son was our runner uh, in middle school and in high school. And he was an unusually talented runner. So he was, as a grade school kid and high school kid, an All-American in uh, a couple of different sports, cross country in particular. And so he would tend to overwhelmingly, particularly in relatively small races, he'd always win these races he'd be in. And cross country races are kind of in a park or off through a field or out in, you know, it's not a clearly marked course. And so I knew when he was 12 or whatever, that he was going to be running a race and he'd be out front. And I also knew that he didn't particularly pay attention much. You know, people were giving him instructions or directions, at least not when, when Dad did. And, and so we would make a point of, of trying to show him. We'd walk the course, and I'd try and show him where the course was to make sure he didn't run off into the woods someplace and, and get lost, because there wasn't going to be anyone to follow. And then we learned to kind of look for a few things that were important to recognize as things you can remember to know, aha, when I see a red flag, I go around the red flag or, or whatever else. So he could, with, uh, without knowing where he was going, he could get to a thing and say, aha, that's a time to, uh, to turn. And so if I use values like that, when you're out front or there's nobody in front of you who you're following, you're doing something novel and new and special like you'll do in your career with the training that you have, having kind of uh, guiding principles to help you will help with all those professional decisions. And I think that's a really important part of it. Yes. So uh, one problem in a lot of graduate students experience is something called imposter syndrome, where we often feel like we don't have what it takes after all, or we don't belong here. Yeah. I'm wondering if you often struggle with imposter syndrome as well. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, that's about, uh, I, I, let me say, I'm being a little bit flippant. Uh, I understand, and I think that everybody does. I uh, had a time years ago, I was the um, class, room about this size, I, I would always give the uh, first lecture to medical students uh, who arrived when I was at UCSF. I'd been, I was a admissions dean. And so I'd meet the class first at 9 o'clock uh, on that first morning when they'd been really working hard as pre-meds to get admitted to medical school. And now they're all sitting in a, really a group about this size out there together. And I said that um, um, if anyone here feels like maybe we made a mistake or that the people around you are really smarter, these are all the ones who are supposed to be here and you just slipped in because, my goodness, she is a biochemist and you just you were okay in biochemistry, but she has 12 publications already. or um, he was a, an EMT and has saved people's lives, and my goodness, you've never done anything like that. So anyone that's feeling that way, know that that's normal, and that uh, that's the way you're supposed to feel when you are, in fact, uh, with peers. That everybody brings something really special to the game, something unusual and unique, and what makes it so terrific. And when you know you're really engaged in an enterprise that you ought to be in, is that you admire the things that everyone around you has done already and brings to the table. What's true, though, and I think what people tend to forget, is that those people also admire you and what you've brought to the table. The training and the focus and everything that you know also adds to the particular game. And that's hard for us to appreciate. So uh, the line I would say is that anybody who feels uh, like uh, we made a mistake, that's normal. Anybody who feels like they belong and this is exactly the right place, then we made a mistake and you need to, uh, <laughs> you, you need to absent yourself. And I think that all of us, when we are, there's a, we had a wonderful um, uh, commencement speech a couple of years ago by um, a graduate student, and, and the title of the speech was Life Begins at the Edge of Your Comfort Zone. And what he said was that there's all the things that are normal where it's been done before and uh, that's fine, and there's the edge of your comfort zone when you're really kind of stretching a bit. And that's when life is really uh, exciting and really meaningful and really memorable. And so the imposter syndrome, I think, uh, feels that way a lot, that you're kind of at the edge of your comfort zone, at the edge of what you know how to do really well, at the edge of what your accomplishments have been uh, to date. 
And you, um, th that's a, a place kind of like riding the edge of the wave. Um, you know, the board, part of the board's in air, you know, and another part's in foam, and there's a lot of hard water in back of you. I think that's, that's where life can really be exciting. I have two stories to say, if I may, about two, two little things. So this particular uh, young man was graduating in engineering. Uh, uh, he's Vietnam. He'd come from Vietnam on his 18th birthday. Uh, uh, hadn't been home since. Uh, hadn't seen a family member. His mother had flown over that morning, so he'd seen his mother for the first time in four years, three and a half years that morning when she came to the U.S. for the first time to hear him give a speech. He, uh, his English is better now than it was, but it was heavily accented. So he had written and then practiced his speech for four months. And I could tell that because sitting and talking to him, I had to really struggle to understand him. When he gave his speech, it was pretty clear to understand because he practiced enunciating all the words. And so he was giving a speech about life at the edge of your comfort zone to 6,000 people in his third language on the first day he'd seen his mother in four years. So he was really at the edge of his comfort zone. And so I, I really I mentioned the value of commitment and, and, and focus. I mean, how really committed he was to doing this thing and how he was giving a speech about the thing in real time. Uh, so I'm about to have a, a transition that's going to be a, a, an uncomfortable, chilly. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, uh, and, and so that's, that, that's part of the fun of all of it, is being new at things and kind of pushing yourself forward. And it feels a little, you feel it a little bit in your tummy. It feels a little bit uncertain. But know that that's normal, and you need to, I think, tap into that uncertainty and say, great, this, this means I'm really fully engaged and I'm, full, I'm here. So, um, uh, so that's good. The, the, the imposter syndrome is a, um, a reflection of uh, insight and, uh, and good self-appreciation. Yes? Two more. Two more. So one thing I've experienced is that the more I think about these sort of values you talked about and the more I see how important they are, the more I realize I don't always live up to them. Yes. So how do you deal with that disappointment and frustration with yourself when you fail sometimes? Tiny personal story, uh, uh, a hyper-personal story. Uh, I had a dream some number of years ago, I don't know when, uh, t 20 years ago or something. And, I, and I, uh, this is exactly true. I was talking in the dream to Walter Cronkite. <laughs> who, who knows who Walter? Raise your hand if you know who Walter Cronkite was. Raise your hand if you've never heard of Walter Cronkite, very <laughs> proudly. So Walter Cronkite was a, an evening news reader, uh, like who uh, the Katie Couric or uh, whoever the people would be reading the evening news now. But he was a newscaster uh, in the 1960s. Actually, he was a war correspondent in the Second World War and then a broadcaster. But he was the anchor person on the CBS Evening News in the 1960s and 70s. And, uh, and he was kind of the, the integrity, honest voice of America. So he just, you know, what Walter Cronkite said would mean, this thing is true. I mean, I, I, just, I mean, Walter Cronkite, I mean, his most famous uh, news report was when he um, uh, reported that John Kennedy was dead. And it was kind of unbelievable news. But then Walter Cronkite said he was dead. My goodness gracious, that means he's actually dead. Because what Walter Cronkite said was true. So, so Walter Cronkite had this sort of outsized, he seemed like a nice guy, I mean, generally. I don't think he was uh, just a funny, he seemed like a really uh, person of high integrity. And I had a, a, a dream, and in the dream, I was asking Walter Cronkite how he got so smart. You know how you do in dreams. You say, Walter Cronkite, how'd you get so smart? <laughs> and, and he said, you know, uh, I, uh, I just make a lot of little mistakes and I try and learn from them. It's not any big thing here or there. It's just a whole bunch of little mistakes, and I try and learn something from each one of those little mistakes all along. And so I think that's uh, what Walter Cronkite was telling me where that came from. Uh, that, that that's the way to deal with our own shortcomings when we say, gosh, here's what that would be like if I did a better job of that. And then say, great, let me just try and do a little better job of that next, next time. And I think that uh, there's a great uh, line in golf uh, which is that golf is not a game of perfect. So you, you can't get it just right. You can maybe get it a little bit better or pretty good. And so I think that the values are really aspirational. They're what you'd like to be. You'd like to be perfectly all these things. You can't be perfect. You just try and be as good at it as you can be and say good. That, and something else I'd say, so not to beat yourself out. However you were yesterday, it was perfect. I mean, that was, that was the best you were going to be yesterday. So you can't say, 
gee, I was awful yesterday. I, I feel bad about that today. Yesterday, you were, you were your perfect self yesterday. That's, that's, that's the best you're going to get for yesterday. What you can do is try and make today a little bit better. And I think that a little bit better is a great thing to try to achieve. And too much is, can be overwhelming. So a little bit each time, like Walter Cronkite. <laughs> yes, last one, I think, yes. Uh, hi, Chancellor Drake. Um, thank you for the talk, real quick. Um, as you're making your transition, uh, are you afraid that your values are going to fade because you're not going to be like, the champion here anymore? I'm not going to be. Like, um, like the principal person is like communicating. Mm, no, no. I think that the. Um, I don't know that I won't be. I mean, again, and uh, I think that's part of the deal. I mean, for each of us, we sort of are the ones communicating to ourselves these things. So I think that you're kind of your own champion, you know. And uh, the idea is that they, they're made for transition, right? This is the, the, the consistent part is the values. And so if you're watching a baseball game or fishing or uh, performing an operation or whatever, the, the values ought to be consistent throughout whatever those things are. And the changing circumstances, ought to, they ought to be um, uh, malleable enough, flexible enough, adaptable enough that, that the changing circumstances make the values seem real. Let me say, uh, so when I was writing these values, I was thinking about, this is also uh, true, I mean, this is the second thing I've said today that's true. Uh, as, as I was, uh, if I was writing the values, I was thinking about Palestinian Israeli uh, uh, issues and our students on campus and thinking about which values I would like for people who had different points of view to practice in this very, very difficult uh, uh, discussion. And that's where they came from. We later had issues that came up at our medical center. that were really, really challenging issues at the medical center. And gosh, when I looked at the values in the medical center, my goodness, they worked just perfectly for helping the medical center to be better as well. And I think the idea is if the values are right, um, they help to guide you. It's, it's the values that are consistent. The circumstances change, but those guiding principles are the things that are important. And I want to make sure I, I circle back to this before I finish. You get to make, you, you create or, or define or describe yours. You can change them. It's not something that's chiseled you know, and, and immutable. You, you, you can change them as you need to. You can improve them. Uh, you can replace them or whatever. And, and you're the ones who you make yours up. It's really just that you have some things that you're thinking about that will help you make decisions in uncertain times, OK? With that, let me again say it's been really great to have a chance to spend this time with you. I appreciate you coming out uh, during lunchtime. And uh, go Eaters.